We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to Heritage Voices, episode 37. I'm Jessica Uquinto, and I'll be your host today. And today we are talking about three years of the Heritage Voices podcast. So this is episode 37, which means last month was three years of this podcast, which is, is pretty exciting. Um, and so to, to celebrate that, we're doing a bit of a recap episode, which we pulled together first for the Society for American Archaeology Conference, and then again for the, the Archaeology Channel Conference on Cultural Heritage Media. So what Lyle and I decided we wanted to do was we wanted to basically pull together a podcast experience for our talks at those two conferences and so the the SAA one was a little shorter so we're going to use the the archaeology channel cultural heritage media presentation <laughs> podcast episode whatever you want to call it uh, as today's episode and basically what we did is we, we talked about the heritage voices podcast and how it's a form of like a community-based type of project basically and and then we also had kind of a recap of, of um, a representative sample of some of the episodes. And we had pictures of our guests um, with quotes where they some of them talked about what the podcast meant to them. So the, the PowerPoint is in the show notes. Um, and it's definitely worth checking out the PowerPoint. So yeah, so I would definitely highly recommend going through the PowerPoint. And even if you don't do it with the audio, just going through and looking at the the pictures because i mean it's really great to like have that human face to all these people that we've been listening to and who i've been talking to mostly by um computer to to record these episodes so it's always great to to have a face to a name but then there's also the added content beyond the pictures of everybody of the quotes about what the podcast means to them that's that you you won't get from the audio so i highly again highly recommend going to the show notes at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com slash heritage voices um, or you can do arcpodnet.com slash heritage voices while you're on the website also check out the the shop area where you can become a member or learn about becoming a member or also you can get some swag under the shop area um, apn swag both of which really help and help this this network keep going and help this podcast keep going. And top of that, you can also on the website find out more information about how to do ads on the shows or become a sponsor of shows. So if you own a CRM company or other related company, for example, and you want to support the network, that could be a great mutually beneficial way to do so. But anyway, um, check those out while you're on the website, checking out the PowerPoint for this episode. And you can also see a, a little recording that I did um, about the, the APN's five-year anniversary and how this podcast started and stuff like that. So check that out as well, uh, that bonus episode. Also, if you are interested in being a guest on the show, uh, if you're Native American from a traditional community, descendant community that you work with, etc., please reach out to me, Jessica at livingheritageanthropology.org. We always like to find new people because, again, I have a, a limited network and we'd love to reach out to people from across the globe. And we've been a little North American heavy, so, but even if you are, you know, North America, that's totally great, but just trying to, to get some more diversity and the easiest way for that to happen is um, for you to, to reach out to me directly. So again, um, if you'd like to be a guest on the show, reach out to me at jessica at livingheritageanthropology.org. Or if you'd like to, to guest host an episode or, or potentially talk about becoming a, an additional host, again, um, focusing on um, traditional communities, um, indigenous communities, etc. So yeah, reach out to me if you 
or interested in either being a guest or potentially a host as well. Or just if you have show suggestions or, or topics you'd like to hear about, recommendations of other people that we should reach out to, etc. Always, all of that would be very, very helpful. Be also taking a brief hiatus from the podcast uh, to work on some other things. We've been going for, for three years, and while I love the, the podcast and, and working on it is a lot of work, um, so we might be taking a brief hiatus to focus on some other things, like, for example, our nonprofit that we've been working on, Living Heritage Research Council, that, again, um, several of the people you've heard from on the show are part of, which includes um, Lyle Belenqua, Sean Gant, uh, Kathleen Van Vlack, um, and some others. Oh, Anna Cordova. <laughs> uh, so Anna Cordova um, from Decolonizing Anthropology episode, I think it was episode six. She is one of our new board members, um, which is very exciting. Teresa Pasquale, former TIPO of the Pueblo of Acoma, is another one. So we're very excited. Um, sorry, that's episode eight. I just checked the show notes. Uh, Anna Cordova was episode eight. Um, but we're very excited about these two new board members. Uh, we really think that they're going to help lead us in an amazing direction because they're two amazing ladies. And um, we just hosted a uh, fundraiser to work on our sustainability. So thank you to all of you who donated to that. And you can always donate to that as well at livingheritage.net slash take hyphen action. So anything, anytime that you want to, to donate to support our work, that would be amazing. Really appreciate it. And we're very excited about our, our two upcoming projects that we have talked about on our Facebook page, um, which you should go to the Living Heritage Research Council Facebook page and like it if you haven't yet, or go to the website and sign up for our newsletter. If you go down to the bottom of the page, so we'll, we'll have announcements about all of our stuff, but but we're very excited about our first two projects, working on the, the Moab field office, doing some videography and hiring Native American interns. Um, so if you would like to be an intern with us, reach out to uh, jessica at livingheritage.net. So that's for, for students or recent graduates, uh, Native American ones. Anyways, just wanted to say thank you for a fabulous three years and... We're looking forward to hearing from you, and we'll see you when we get back from our brief hiatus. Thank you. Enjoy this episode. Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high-quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. Zencaster allows us to record high-quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on, and that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30% off your first three months or go to Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R dot com and use the code HEVO, H-E-V-O. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Baker's, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Baker's worth it every time. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Save big money on pressure-treated lumber for your outdoor project at Menards. Menards has the best in-stock selection of AC2 pressure-treated lumber, decking, and fencing. All easy to load in our drive through lumber yard. Choose from our huge inventory and build your project to last. Plus, you can get free estimates fast with our fence and deck design programs in-store or online at Menards.com. Save big money at Menards. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to respectfully acknowledge that this meeting is being held on the ancestral homelands of the Kalapuya people and to acknowledge both their forced removal by the U.S. government from this land and their continued and sincere relationship with this landscape. 
All right. So to get us started, I'm going to talk a little bit about the podcast. Well, first of all, what is a podcast? I mean, half the people I talk to don't even know what that means because I didn't until a couple years ago. And then we're going to talk about the Heritage Voices podcast and how it is a community-based approach to public archaeology, public anthropology, etc. So first, what is a podcast? So a podcast is basically a pre-recorded online radio show is, is the best equivalent that I can give you. And basically people listen off of the Archaeology Podcast Network website itself, or they can also download to their phones or iPods. And that way they can listen while they're driving, working out, anything else where maybe it doesn't require a lot of brain power, but they want to have something engaging in the background still. So housework, et cetera. And the other nice thing about podcasts is that they, as you can tell from this podcast, they have a very informal feel and it provides an opportunity for people to see a, a human face that they might not in traditional journalism, for example, or, you know, published journal articles. <laughs> so the Heritage Voices podcast, we, Lyle and I, focus on centering indigenous and other descendant community voices on discussions in anthropology, CRM, heritage, land management, etc. So that includes indigenous archaeology, collaborative ethnography, tribal consultation, et cetera. And from the beginning, we really wanted to make sure that we took a community-based approach to this podcast. So before it even began, we were having conversations with tribal representatives, indigenous archaeologists, and others to, to help shape the show and make sure that people felt good about the show and the direction that it was headed. And then also, for example, guests have control over their episodes so they can help shape the episode design, what they want to talk about, what they don't want to talk about, and they get a copy of the recording before it is aired so they can provide any and all edits until they feel completely comfortable with the recording itself. And if it needs review from additional people, like let's say a supervisor or um, someone else from their tribe, that's totally fine as well. And Another example of how it's community-based is that guests are free to share it on their local or tribal radio stations as well. So a lot of times we have people who are trying to, to bring outreach back to their own communities because a lot of other archaeologists aren't doing that with their communities. So this is a, a nice opportunity for people to have a wide reach within their own community as well, talking about their projects. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Baker's, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Baker's worth it every time. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Save big money on pressure-treated lumber for your outdoor project at Menards. Menards has the best in-stock selection of AC2 pressure-treated lumber, decking, and fencing. All easy to load in our drive through lumber yard. Choose from our huge inventory and build your project to last. Plus, you can get free estimates fast with our fence and deck design programs in-store or online at Menards.com. Save big money at Menards. Okay, so now that you have a little background on podcasts in general and our show specifically, I am going to pass the microphone over to Lyle, who is going to talk about why he thinks the Heritage Voices podcast is important and what it means to him. My name is Lyle Bolinqua. I'm from the village of Pakovi on 3rd Mesa from the Hopi Reservation. For over 20 years now, I suppose, I've been working as a professional archaeologist here in the Four Corners area. I guess you could say my career started off when I was a young kid um, on the reservation. I'm fortunate to come from a family where um, farmers, were ranchers, were hunters, were hikers, were fishermen. So we're always out on the landscape learning about our history in some form or another. So growing up, I was 
infused with the idea of learning who you are as a as a Pueblo person, as a Hopi person, and how that relates to the outside world. So all that came together in a great uh, crossing of the roads, and ultimately I landed in the field of archaeology. So uh, fortunate to be able to continue to do that work, but also able to transition from the science side, maybe not a strict science side, but also into the public education side. So. And so it's a great thing that, uh, lo and behold, another project came about. And so that is what I'm going to talk about here briefly. So really, you know, by nature, you know, we grew up in an oral tradition, right? So that's how I learned who I was as a Hopi person was sitting down with my grandparents, my father, uh, other folks in my family talking about who I am as a person and how we relate that history to a larger landscape out there. So for me, and I think other Native people out there, of course, you know, podcast is nothing new. It's, there's thousands of podcasts going on in the world right now. For me, I see it just as another avenue, another resource for folks out there to learn about uh, Indigenous perspectives as it relates to archaeology. We have a lot to say, so we really need to find avenues where we can grab people's attention, right? And, and have a really... The thing I like about audio is you can kind of get an intimate sense of a person and really hear the sincerity, the emotion in somebody's voice and how they uh, talk about the land out there. And so I just feel like this is a very good opportunity for myself and other Native Americans out there to have another avenue to voice our opinions, tell our stories, you know, and have it documented for future generations. I think a lot of what I take from my involvement in this type of work is knowing that my words can be played anywhere. You know, I can take this into a classroom. I can take it onto the field. If somebody is physically unable to go out into the field, I can take my stories to them and help them get a better understanding of who I am as a Hopi person. And so for me, it's just... We're not into brown breaking technology, but what we're doing is building on a tradition that has been a part of our lives for thousands of generations. Being able to speak and relate uh, orally is, is one way that we, whether it's in English or your native language, you need to maintain that ability to really be able to express yourself in an oral manner. some of our past guests. So here are some clips from past episodes so you can see the range of what we talk about on the podcast. And then we'll finish out with some past guests sharing what the podcast means to them. Thank you. One thing that, that uh, the Pueblos and uh, the other tribes in New Mexico are concerned with is there is nothing set in stone as far as the protection of Chaco. Uh, there are many oil wells out there and they are just getting closer and closer and closer. And with the technology now, the, the, they are uh, drilling horizontally, not just vertically. I had met people who were descendants of plantations who lived within walking distance, who still went to the plantation that uh, their de descendants had been enslaved on people who they could actually name right. uh, and I was like what and yeah. so they would show me cabins and places that they themselves had lived in and so I was forced to come to grips with the fact that people were relating to this not you know again they on the, the macro level they understood they, no one again had any love for anything that happened there total exploitation and all those things but they also right. shared with me family stories with they how they learned to cook and what or that their, their uncles were brick makers or builders or you know how they made the sweet grass baskets or how they praised and where they went to church and all those kinds of things so they were telling me stories about home and i started looking at those places not only as you know plantation of exploitation but a place that people call home and you know up to that point tribal people 
particular the elders in California, the they didn't want to tell anybody where things were because they would be looted or destroyed. Right. right. And so confidentiality was really the number one issue was to keep everything confidential. And that was really in conflict with the idea of of having to tell people, wait, you know, we don't want you to build that housing project there because that's our our creation place. Right. You know, and, and, right. and it seems so in conflict with the idea of like these sacred places to be sitting down with a developer and saying, look, this is where our people came from the earth or this spring is where we sprung from the earth through the water. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, mm-hmm. it's really uh, difficult to bridge that gap. And so the legislation in 2004 really set the table for tribes to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, I actually went to a rock art panel when I was at SAA's. And somebody was talking about the spent years trying to figure out this one petroglyph and what does it mean? And they couldn't figure it out because it looks just like linear writing. And and they brought a uh, Crow tribal member out to the site and he goes, oh, that's a tobacco plant. And then he looks down <laughs> and he goes, oh, those are tobacco, old tobacco leaves. Yeah, they probably had a tobacco ceremony here a while ago. And Sarah Gale just was like, wait, what? We've been, been spending years trying to figure this out. And the crow elder was like, yeah, that's just how it is. It's like, oh my God, this, this is why you need indigenous people here when you're doing archaeology. at right below Davis Dam because of the flooding um, and the towns that were built in our area they decided they were going to channelize the river and so basically it reduced it from the free free flowing um, river that it was you know that sustained all land and we used to have cottonwood trees willow trees mesquite tree was so abundant there and our people lived within these areas you know where the they had inlets and we had waterways we had ponds all those things that sustained our our livelihood and then our crops you know the fish that used to be in that river but once they decided to control the floodways and everybody was moving west and to make it easier for people to get across the river they narrowed the river to what it is today basically it's a a pretty big ditch that runs for (laughs) About 20 miles and, you know, and wrap the whole sides of the river and, and then cut off the water source to all those plant communities and all the animals, you know, everything that was there just died off because they didn't have the natural flow of the river anymore. And so even our people got displaced because of what happened. right there on the road that's visible as you drive by and that's that's the the flat top mound the middle woodland flat top mound uh, that most people think of as as the site as Naniwea but um, over through the swamp there's another um, really interesting geologic formation it's, it's actually a natural cave system and it's right next to the headwaters of the Pearl River mm-hmm. which based on my understanding of mm-hmm. woodland and Mississippi and archaeology is probably why Naniwea was built there. Um, you know, you often see those, those mound sites located near caves, near uh, headwaters of, of rivers um, and, and those kind of features. So um, and and Naniwea is really probably the most significant place in, in kind of Choctaw understanding because uh 
all of our, our origin stories trace back to that specific place. Um, so it's a really important place and, uh, the cave and, and all the other, uh, things on the other side are from a Choctaw perspective, equally important to the actual like mound itself. Cause it's all a part of the same place to us. audio that you're about to hear is him speaking specifically of Marissa and I's tribe. And um, conveniently, um, a lot of people still are not aware uh, that he said this about the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation. So here's that audio. Is this you discussing Indian blood? We're going to judge people by whether they have Indian blood, whether they're qualified to run a gaming casino or not? Uh, That probably is me, absolutely. Because I'll tell you what, if you look, if you look at some of the reservations that you've approved, you, sir, and your great wisdom have approved, I will tell you right now, uh, they don't look like Indians to me. And they don't look like the Indians. Now, maybe we say politically correct or not politically correct. They don't look like Indians to me. And they don't look like Indians to Indians. And a lot of people are laughing at it, and you're telling how tough it is, how rough it is to get approved. Well, you go up to Connecticut, and you look. Now, they don't look like Indians to me, sir. Thank God that's not the test of whether or not people have rights in this country or not, whether or not they pass your look test. Depends whether, yeah, depends whether or not you're approving it, sir. No, no, it's not a question of whether I'm approving it. It's not a question whether I'm approving it. Mr. Trump, you know, you know in the history of this country where we've heard this discussion before, they don't look Jewish to me. Oh, really? They don't look well, Indian to me. They don't look Italian to me. Mm-hmm. And that was a test for whether people could go into business or not go into business, whether they could get a bank loan. You're too black. You're not black enough. I want to find out. That's you, not a, well, then why are you appro- you're approving a, for Indian? Why don't you approve it for everybody then? That's so, not a, if your case is non-discriminatory, why don't you approve for everybody? You're saying well, you only Indians. Wait a minute, you sir. Stand for it and you're saying less. only Indians can have the reservations. Only Indians can have the gaming. So why aren't you approving it for everybody? Why are you being discriminatory? Why is it that the Indians don't pay tax, but everybody else does? I do. So that is uh, Donald J. Trump, 1993. Because uh, uh, Congress, uh, or in the hearing, was, uh, they asked him to come and speak on a concern that they had heard about, uh, about there being corruption in Indian gaming, which was also fabricated. Um, and he decided to target uh, our tribe at the time. So it's very real to us. Um, talk about identity, when we talk about um, unfairness, you know, Um, and a lot of, like I said, a lot of people uh, are not aware of that piece of audio right there. Yeah, like people think of historically as the Ojibwe as sort of like hunter gatherers or people that followed the seasonal round, which is true. But, um, you know, Ojibwe came to Red Lake and they are actual, actually agriculturists. And there's a documented history of when there was a bad year for wild rice and a lot of the other Ojibwe communities in Minnesota couldn't didn't harvest enough wild rice to make it through the winter. Um, Red Lake Ojibwe people had storage of food um, from not food they'd gathered, but food they'd planted and tended to and were, you know, agriculturists for. And that kept, um, so people came to Red Lake and were able to rely on our food that we had grown when there was a bad year for wild rice. Mm -hmm. Um, So that, that's also really interesting um, and it's sort of like, Uh, part of indigenous food that you don't typically hear about, that agricultural aspect. Hi, this is Sandra Hernandez. 
and Colin Rambo from the Tohono Indian, Indian Tribe in, in Bakersfield, Bakersfield, California. California. Discovering the Heritage Voices podcast has been just as exciting and rewarding as the rediscovery and revitalization of our own tribal heritage. We look forward to a bright future for the Heritage Voices podcast so that tribal voices and knowledge are continually shared with the world. Our heart is good towards you. From, From all of us here at the Tohon Indian, Indian Tribe. Voices podcast. You can find show notes at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash heritage voices. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or the Google Music Store. Also, if you like the show, please share with your friends or write us a review. If you have any questions, comments, or show suggestions, please reach out to me at jessica at livingheritageanthropology.org or you can find me on Facebook through Living Heritage Anthropology or on Twitter at Living Heritage A. As always, thank you to Lyle Blanqua and Jason Nez for their collaboration on our incredible logo. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more information. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Baker's, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Baker's worth it every time. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Save big money on pressure-treated lumber for your outdoor project at Menards. Menards has the best in-stock selection of AC2 pressure-treated lumber, decking, and fencing. All easy to load in our drive through lumber yard. Choose from our huge inventory and build your project to last. Plus, you can get free estimates fast with our fence and deck design programs in-store or online at Menards.com. Save big money at Menards. Pro.